I'll start with the basics, the difference between turbocharging and supercharging. There's all these words that have been bandied around for years, so I'll keep it very simple. There's the engine, nice beautiful rectangular engine. Um, exhaust system, I'm going to keep this simplistic, coming out of there um, into uh, a turbine here. And um, the exhaust gases, as they escape from the engine, turn the turbine, which has a shaft coming out of it with another turbine here. And that um, is in the inlet, so it draws the inlet air here, goes through the turbine, which compresses it, and into the engine there. Super simple. That is a turbo setup. And the beauty of that is, as this comes out to the exhaust here, um, the beauty of a turbocharger system is that it's extremely efficient because um, the, what's coming out of the engine is, is spent gas anyway. It, it's, um, it's used up gas, um, quite hot, of course, which means that this part of the turbocharger is warm and you do get heat transfer to this part, the incoming air, which causes that to warm up. And I'll come on to that in a minute. But um, if we then look at a supercharged engine, um, the exhaust escapes normally to atmosphere with nothing to help or retain it. And then on the front of the engine, you've got a, a, the crankshaft pulley here, the, the main pulley out of the engine, which has a belt on it, which is linked to a supercharger there, which is a rotating device with, uh, depending on the type it is, um, it will have uh, veins inside it which compress the air. So we have the incoming air um, here, which go into the supercharger, and then it comes out of the supercharger and into the inlet side of the engine there. The difference between the two is, um, the, the engine has to work slightly hard on acceleration to make this spool up as it's called. So this is running, it's just turning like that very slowly. The engine accelerates, produces more hot gas. That quickly accelerates this to well over 100,000 revs per minute, 10 times the speed of a jet engine. Um, and consequently, it causes this end to turn and it sucks more air in and blows it under pressure into the engine. And the fact that it's being pressurized gives you the power. Supercharger, as the engine, so the supercharger is permanently connected in a lot of cases, but not all. It actually draws the, uh, the air in, compresses it mechanically with um, blades. And that result is it comes into the engine under pressure again. They're all permanently connected up, but they have a clutch on the front here, which is electromagnetically controlled more often than not. So there's a solenoid in there controlled by an electrical feed. Um, and when the engine gets to about 2000 RPM, the supercharger actually cuts in and starts to force the air into the engine. And you can normally on supercharged engines, you can hear a whining noise as the supercharger starts to work. Superchargers, um, generally are not as efficient as turbochargers because this, as, I, as I've already said, the exhaust gases are coming out anyway with a turbo. But superchargers uh, do not create as much heat because it's going nowhere near the exhaust. Um, so there are disadvantages and advantages for, for each one. Um, superchargers are, uh, to put this into perspective, if you had a 500 brake horsepower engine at 6,000 RPM, 7,000 RPM, the supercharger would be actually taking up to 100 brake horsepower from that engine. So um, you're actually losing 15% of your power to actually drive the supercharger to create 30% extra power. So uh, there is a trade-off. that There's no perfect solution to this, and that's why um, so many engines are sold with superchargers, and so many engines are sold with turbochargers. Um, now we move on to the, the charge cooler and the intercooler. I'll just get rid of my electrical feed here. Sorry about that, Mr. Supercharger. I'll actually, I'll actually do it on this one. Um, helps, particularly on turbocharged installations, is if you have a device here um, with veins in it, like a, a car radiator that the air has to pass through, what actually happens, this is called an intercooler, 
And what actually happens is the, the, the air has been forced in, it's warm because it's been through the turbo that's connected to the uh, exhaust side of the turbocharger. The intercooler actually does two things, both of which are a win-win situation. First of all, um, it cools the air, and the, the cooler air is, uh, the more, particularly going into a warm engine, the more it cools down the combustion chamber, which has um, the effect of not causing the, the combustion chamber to overheat as much. And if, if it did overheat, it could destroy itself in nanoseconds. You could have pinking and knocking and um, detonation and all sorts of uh, things which are almost one and the same, but they, they, they melt piston crowns just like that. It can happen incredibly quickly. So the intercooler, you've got uh, the air going through there. So an intercooler basically, for example, um, will be like that, with a series of vanes, like a radiator, which the air can pass through. And then on, the, on this side of the, inter, the intercooler, you have a pipe going in and a pipe going out the other side. The most um, obvious application is this is under the front of the car, behind the front bumper. Uh, it has its own grill, and the air going into the engine um, comes out of that side and comes in that side and the air undergoes cooling as it mixes with the, the air coming through the, uh, the, radi the, effectively a second radiator under the car, the front of the car or wherever, um, and uh, it actually cools the air. But the other thing is, because the air is cooler, it's denser. Um, the density of air is directly proportional to its temperature. So um, because, because it's had this cooling effect on its way between the turbo and the engine, uh, it actually means that you have more air going into the combustion chamber and you can actually inject more fuel into the combustion chamber here, um, which gives you more power. So um, an intercooler does not, uh, does not, is not an instant giver of extra power, but it, it lays on, it lays open the door for extra power because it's cooler, which keeps the inside of the engine cool, but it also makes the air more dense as it goes into the engine. And that means with denser air, you can inject a bit more fuel and that equals power. There is one other kind of um, intercooler and that's called a charge cooler. And the difference between an intercooler and a charge cooler is that you still, um, you still have the air going through here but the charge cooler is normally not on the front of the engine. It's somewhere else in the vehicle. And it doesn't have to be in the airflow at all. And the reason for that is that uh, the charge cooler has a, a cooling hose coming in and out, which can be coolant from the engine. So water and antifreeze mix which means you can actually mount a charge cooler anywhere you like on the car. And um, as long as it's got coolant, cold coolant fresh from the radiator, passing through it and exchanging heat with the heat that's coming into the engine. And this can be, even the, the, uh, the air coming in and out of here is also sealed within a box. So you don't actually see if it is a charge cooler, all you see is essentially that. Air comes in here and it comes out cooled there with the cool engine uh, coolant coming through there. It has the same effect as um, an intercooler. I'm, I'm, I'm thinking the examples I can think of off the top of my head are uh, the, uh, the Bentley uh, V8 engine, the big V8, as uh, it, it became known at Crewe. Um, and when they uh, introduced in for the 94 model year a Zytec engine management system, which was vastly superior to the old KE um they put a charge cooler. If, that, if this is the V8 engine um, there, um, if we have something like that, so in the middle here is the, uh, is the induction system. And then you've got the eight ports here, four on this side and four on that side, 
what uh, Bentley and Rolls-Royce did was actually put the charge cooler in the middle so that the air had to come in through here and there was coolant coming in the front and out the back of the charge cooler so it could it actually didn't need to have any air as I say flowing over it and yet the net result was this air going into the engine got super cooled and you could actually have a fraction more turbo boost or more reliability and longevity um, without actually sacrificing power So, we've established the basic precepts of um, forced induction, as it's called. But let's move on to a couple of other answers. Why, in the early days of the turbocharger, in the 70s and 80s, when they started to be really incorporated in more road cars, and I must mention that the Americans pioneered turbocharging in cars, to the best of my knowledge, in 1962, with, I think it was the Oldsmobile Jetfire and something else that I can't bring to mind. So I must salute the Americans on coming up with this first. One of the big problems at that time was turbo lag, as it was called. So um, when you put your foot down, it took a while for the turbo to spool up, as it's called, for the, turbo, the inertia of the turbine to actually get going and help to force the induction on the car. And it was all or nothing. It was almost like a switch. It wasn't a steady progression turbo lag um, and the main reason for that was um, if we have our trusty engine here um, the uh, the turbo coming into it was probably quite big because um, when a car manufacturer went to a turbocharger manufacturer in, in the late 70s early 80s they went to either Garrett, IHI, KKK the market was very limited and they had to buy off-the-shelf off turbochargers. So to go back to my Bentley story, the original uh, turbocharger that they used on the six and three-quarter litre V8 was a T04, which was a truck turbocharger. Um, and that took a long while for this to get going before it could push the air into the engine. And because of that, um, you put your foot down, um, you're waiting for the engine, the boost to come on song, and this is so big and heavy, the impeller in the turbocharger here, it takes a while to spool up. So, one of the tricks that car manufacturers used um, in the uh, early days was what is called a dump valve. So, uh, you had a, um, a little valve here, a pressure relief valve occasionally, which could, uh, um, vaguely, which could open it. Uh, open up and um, it allowed the pressure to bypass round and out. So you, you were basically expending energy um, and this, this pressure relief valve was controlled by the inlet and I'm very well aware I'm doing this the wrong way around now because before the inlet was here and the exhaust was there but bear with me. Um, and once the inlet pressure uh, suddenly fell. So the turbo is boosting up, it's providing boost into the engine, this is closed and then you go to change gear so you take your pressure off and what ha would happen if this wasn't there was that would start to slow down again um, because as you take your foot off the accelerator you've suddenly lost the free flow of air into the engine on a petrol engine um, and uh, the turbo that would slow down and then you'd have to go through the whole cycle again when you change gear of getting it to spool up. So what they did was they put this dump valve in, it sensed from the inlet when the pressure had suddenly dropped as you took your foot off to change gear. This opened which meant there was no back pressure on the turbine so it could carry on and maintain its speed uh, releasing to fresh air and then you put your foot down in the next gear and this is already spinning which gave you less turbo lag. All clever stuff really and of course any self-respecting boy racer loves a dump valve because when they change gear on their um, whatever it is Vauxhall Corsa or something and they get this as it changes gear that's what it's all about particularly if people within a, a, a 30 foot radius can hear it as well. Yes! Uh, so uh, that's the history of the dump valve. The other thing, and this is getting more obvious now, is that turbo technology has moved on. And one of the other reasons is because 
turbo and car manufacturers, it's been around a long time, this technology now, um, have become more savvy as to the size of the turbo. So these days, turbos are matched to different makes and models, and it can be a lot smaller because um, it's more tailored to the, the capacity and the revs and the airflow of the engine. And if it's smaller, it's easier to spool up. And that's why on modern cars, you get a linear um, power curve as opposed to a stop start suddenly flicking a switch like a Porsche 911 Turbo from, from the late 1970s, something like this. I must do a video on one of those soon. Um, and that, uh, that's one of the reasons why modern cars actually don't uh, need as much spooling up, don't have turbo lag. The other thing is they might have two. Uh, they might have two, tur some cars these days have um, twin turbo um, and a twin turbo setup Um, means that if this is if this is the induction side of the car I'm talking about the air coming into the engine now you would have a turbo on each uh, uh, this works very well on V engines you have a turbo on each side of the engine and it pushes air into the middle so that that's a, a sort of uh, four-cylinder twin-turbo setup or six-cylinder and on a V engine they're different now because they actually put the turbos in the center of the V but you would have one turbo there and one turbo there each sucking air in from atmosphere to the air inlet and then um, it would go to the different cylinders there like that and that's a very efficient twin-turbo system the reason why it's twin-turbo is the two systems are mutually exclusive um, and what a bi-turbo system means is that you still have the two turbochargers but they actually come and feed all the cylinders together like that so both, bi -tur both turbochargers have to be compressing at the same pressure otherwise you get an imbalance but that's fine that's what they usually do they just sort themselves out bi-turbo means two turbos operating to all cylinders. Twin turbo means one turbocharger to one set of cylinders and another to another. Now, of course, the story of forced induction is almost as old as the story of the internal combustion engine itself. An engine itself, easy for me to say. Uh, it's been around a very long time and um, it was used uh, even on, um, one, of the, one of the interesting things is um, Detroit, General Motors in Detroit used the supercharger on their two-stroke diesel engines. They had uh, a, a, um, a range of two-stroke diesel engines uh, which powered also landing craft, boats, trains, and um, even Greyhound buses used the, um, I think it was the 8V71 um, General Motors engine, which was a fantastic bit of kit. But the, the thing with two-stroke diesels is they, if they're what's called crank case aspirated, and that's probably for another video. Um, maybe even bouncing off the end of the nerdy at the scale extraordinaire there. But if if they if they if they don't um, work as a normal two-stroke engine, they need a belt-mounted, a, a a solid-mounted supercharger along, driven by the engine all the time, to force air in to make them actually work properly. And I'm trying to think. There's um, there's some wonderful film footage of old Greyhound. Um, whatever they were called, um, streamliner buses or, or scenic, scenic cruiser buses from the 1950s with those screaming two-stroke supercharged V8s. I'm thinking, thinking of the scene in North by Northwest, that iconic movie where um, Cary Grant gets dropped off at the Prairie bus stop, I think it is, in the middle of nowhere. Uh, just before the uh, the biplane, the crop dusting biplane tries to kill him, and uh, the the the, uh, the Greyhound bus with its uh, V8 uh, supercharged two-stroke engine drives away, and that that screaming noise that's in so many films is uh, unique. Um, so um, yeah, thanks. We've only just scratched the surface there, but thanks very much for watching. Hope you've enjoyed it. Uh, don't forget to please like and subscribe. It does make a difference and we'll be back with something else 
very soon.